Hello and welcome back. Today we're talking all about weight loss and the concept that weight loss may not come down to calorie restriction and more about what's going on with your microbiome. We're joined by Kieran Krishnan, a microbiologist and wealth of knowledge. Guys, you do not want to miss this episode. It is mind blowing. So let's get to it. Hello, Kieran Krishnan. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Matt. So great to be here with you guys. <laughs> we are so excited to dive into the, to the topic of the microbiome, leaky gut, and how it relates to weight loss and how what we can do about that. So thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. And it's such, such an important topic. Um, obviously, as a society, we've all been spending billions of dollars over the last several decades on trying to figure out weight loss solutions. And we've been really missing a really important key. So we get to discuss that real important key to metabolic health and weight loss uh, today. So I'm excited to be able to do that. Awesome. So I think we should start off the call with a bit about yourself, Kieran, uh, your, how you became a microbiologist and how you got so excited about this weird little community of bugs in our, in our bodies. So if you could share. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, my mom is a doctor and, and my dad's a uh, engineer. And so I've always been around the sciences. Um, growing up in Malaysia and India, you know, there's a big focus culturally on science and math and medicine. And so, you know, you're, you're thrown into that, into that space with that being the, the main focus. We didn't do sports so much in India, right? And nobody cared if you could throw a ball or hit, or hit a ball. <laughs> they really cared about how good you were at math. That's how cool <laughs> people were defined, right? And so um, I got to accelerate and be really cool because of that, because I was a huge nerd and I was always good at science. Um, but, but the most fascinating thing for me was uh, working, like spending time in my mom's clinic, uh, I was so fascinated with the work she would do from a medical standpoint um, that I would spend a lot of time going down to the clinic when she was doing procedures and trying to figure out, like, how does she know how to do that? You know, like, how does she help people the way she helps? Um, and there was this one uh, story in particular that I remember of a, of a guy that came in from the village. This is when we lived in Malaysia. And uh, he came in and he had dropped something massive on his, on his big toe. And his toe was swollen maybe three times the size of a normal toe, right? And he was clearly in agony. It was a, it was a black, big, blue, black toe. Um, and and she, he hobbled in, and, and I was fascinated. I was like, what is she going to do to fix this, right? And so I asked her, I said, Mom, can I watch what you do? And she's like, of course, come on in. And so he sat on the table. She got out these menacing-looking tools, plier-looking things. And I'm like, what is she going to do with that, right? And then she proceeded to like take and cut off and pull off his toenail. Ugh. And I'm like, what? Wow. She's making it worse. You know, like she's destroying his foot even worse. And then and then she poked a hole on the bed underneath his toenail and squeezed it. And all this dark blood oozed out. Right. <sighs> and and as gruesome as that sounded, wow. it was like the biggest relief to him. Because the source of the pain is when when you when you have that um, edema in there from the from the toe getting hit, it's bleeding inside underneath the toenail, and that pressure is like all the pain. And so she relieved that pressure, and he was like in heaven. She cleaned it, wrapped it up, and sent him home, and he was so happy. And I remember that resonating with me so much because the knowledge that she had of how his toe works really allowed her to help him. Right. So that's when I became really intrigued with this idea of like, how does everything work, especially in our bodies? And that took me right to science. And when I knew in college that I was going to go into some field of science, I was trying to figure out which field of science. And uh, I watched this movie called Outbreak about a, about a pa pandemic, if you will, um, and became really excited and interested in this idea of chasing around pathogens and viruses and trying to find solutions to them. So that got me jumping in. Uh, with both feet into the deep end of microbiology, and it's a it's a fascinating world to be in. Wow, well, that's so cool! I love that story. Um, yeah, it's sort of like a, the superhero origin story. You know? <laughs> exactly. I, it was all in my head of the, the Marvel <laughs> yeah. things on there. Superhero origin story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so specifically, um, a lot of people weight loss. It's a multi billion dollar industry. Um, it spikes every Christmas um, and people get all behind it and a lot of people fail. It's a huge industry, I think, built upon failure. Um, 
Why is that? What do you think are some of the key things that, that we can learn from our gut that is maybe holding people back from lasting, you know, success with weight loss? Yeah, I think the, the biggest reason why um, weight loss research tools, components and all really haven't been successful for people is because we're not considering what happens to food when it enters your system, right? And and the reason we're not considering it is because we're taking this very simplistic approach of food comes in, it gets broken up and chopped up by enzymes and hydrochloric acid and all that in your, in your digestive system. And then you're gonna absorb a certain amount of calories, whether it's fat or protein or carbohydrates, there's gonna be some sort of sugar in, um, you know, spike that occurs. And then ultimately the whole thought is you've got a certain number of calories coming in, how many calories are you burning out? And that's gonna be the balance that creates weight. Now, fortunately, the human body is far more cool and complicated than that, you know? <laughs> and so what we're forgetting is this community of about 40 trillion organisms that live in your gut where the food is going that does over 90% of the digestion of the food for you, right? We only consume a relatively small amount of the actual food we eat. When I say consume, I mean actually absorb and assimilate it into our system. Most of the rest of it is going to the microbes that live there and they make compounds out of it. And it changes who's more prevalent in the, in the gut when it comes to the microbes. And those changes, depending on what they make from the food we eat and who is going to be prevalent, will dictate our weight, right? So this was very, very clear in some really early studies on the microbiome. Here's how they did the studies. Imagine you can visualize, they took um, uh, twins, identical twins, uh, human twins, who have exactly the same genetics, right? But then one twin is overweight and the other twins of normal body weight. And there's lots of twins that are that way. So despite their identical genetics, they have completely different body compositions. Then what they did is they took mice that they've reared under control conditions. These are normally metabolic mice. Um, they will then uh, take the mice and then they will take, uh, they will give it antibiotics. It'll wipe out the mouse's uh, microbiome. They will take the microbiome from the, from the two twins and implant it into the mouse. What they found was that the mice implanted with the overweight twins um, microbiome ended up gaining weight. And then the mouse that was implanted with the normal weight um, uh, twins microbiome would stay at, at the normal mouse weight, even though they're feeding them the same amount of food. And then what they could do is wipe out the mouse's microbiome and switch it and take the overweight mice and give them the lean uh, twins microbiome and then the vice versa and feed them the same amount of food again. And then the overweight mouse will start losing weight. And then the, the regular weight mouse will start gaining weight. So they could do this experiment in so many different ways. And they would find over and over again, depending on what the microbiome looks like in the overweight person, they could trigger weight gain in the, in the subject animal. And then this also got proven out in, in a couple of cases with humans. You guys have heard of fecal transplants, right? Fecal microbiome transplants. So there was a lady that, um, and this was a case that was written up, there was a lady that was always athletic, always fit her entire life. She, one thing she didn't struggle with is weight, but she had, um, I believe it was like colitis, or she had an inflammatory bowel condition. And um, so she ended up finally getting a fecal transplant to try to resolve that. So she got a fecal transplant from an unknown donor who was quote unquote, a typical healthy donor. And although the colitis condition became okay, over the next several weeks, she started gaining weight. And, and she never, in her entire life, this is a almost 40-year-old, never struggled with the weight. She never changed her diet. She didn't do anything. She now, over the next 30, 60 days, became a huge struggle with her for weight. And when they went back and looked, the donor was actually overweight. So they, they transplanted the overweight response to food to this person who had never had that struggle, right? So it's very clear that the type of microbiome you have changes how your body responds to the food you eat. Wow. When I first heard that twin mouse <laughs> study, mm -hmm. it blew my mind. Uh, it really highlights the power of the microbiome to really change how our body just works. Um, could you tell me the difference between these two microbiomes? Like why why would one have have a, a weight gain <laughs> impact and one have a weight loss impact? Yeah, so there's a few critical functions. Um, you know, number one is the way the analogy I always give is, 
you know, we all know that person that can eat whatever they want, never gain weight, right? And we're always like, ah, oh, that annoying person can uh, has a high metabolism, we would say, right? As if they're burning more calories just breathing versus somebody who struggles with weight. And that's not actually true, right? It's not about caloric burn. Um, they've got a different microbiome composition. So the key features within the microbiome that either make you gain weight or make you uh, stay lean, almost no matter what you eat, is um, number one, the presence of a couple of keystone strains. So keystone strains within the microbiome are designated as strains that are so important to the structure and the function of the microbiome that they are keystone, right? Keystone in the in architectural sense is a big stone that keeps the whole arc together. Um, these strains do a number of really important things. Number one, so one example of a keystone strain is Acromantia mucinophila. Another example of, uh, of one is uh, Bifidobacterium longum, which is another keystone strain. Or Bifidobacterium infantis will, will do some of these functions as well. But one of the key things that they do is when you eat food, so let's say I struggle with weight all the time and Sarah, you don't. Um, when I, if we eat the same exact meal, right? I will eat food, it's 1500 calories or so, it goes into my system. Um, my, my stomach and my small intestine will break down what it can and absorb some protein, some carbohydrates and so on. When the rest of the bulk of the food goes into my large intestine, my bacteria are going to convert that into things like ammonia gas, hydrogen sulfide, other things that create more inflammation. And that inflammatory response will make the, my gut lining leaky in the presence of that food, right? So one of the things then that occurs when my gut is leaky, endotoxins from my gut will leak into my bloodstreams, will make its way into my brain, and will disrupt all of the satiety uh, mechanisms that tell me to stop eating. So after I have that meal, very shortly after, I'm going to feel like eating some more, or even right then, even though I should be satiated, I'm actually going to reach for more stuff. I'm going to reach for the chips that's there. I'm going to reach for the muffin that's right after. Now, let's say your, your system is working the way it should. You're going to digest and take in very similar amounts of proteins and things that my gut did. But when the rest of the food goes down to your large intestine, you're going to have beneficial bacteria like acromantia or certain types of bifidobacteria that convert a lot of that food mass into things like short chain fatty acids. What happens then is we have receptors all around our intestinal lining and our fat cells for these short chain fatty acids. When our receptors bind the short chain fatty acids, the first thing is it does is triggers the, uh, the release of leptin. Leptin will tell your brain, hey, I'm full, stop eating, right? So your desire to eat more will go away completely. So number one, you'll take in less calories just from that meal. Number two, it'll also activate something called AMPK. AMPK is a signal from your fat to the rest of your body, to every cell in your body that goes, food is here, burn fat for calories. So it turns on every cell's ability to use fat for, for energy and makes you kind of a walking, talking, fat-burning machine. So then you don't have this net uh, response of taking uh, caloric content and storing it as fat the way my body does. My body would be sending these inflammatory signals. The satiety signals are getting messed up, so I'm feeling more hungry. At the same time, the excess calories are getting stored as fat right? Because I'm not having the fat burning signals. I'm not having the satiety signals. So that's just one uh, aspect of it. Another aspect of it is um, the actual amount of calories you can pull in. There's something called energy harvesting. People that tend to struggle with weight actually can pull in more calories into their system from food than people that don't struggle with weight. On average, you could take two people, in this case, you and I would do, use that as a comparison. We eat the same meal, my body will actually extract upwards of 200 calories more from the same meal than your body would, right? And if that happens for 10 meals in a row, that's almost a pound of fat extra that's going in and not getting burned because I'm not getting that metabolic burn uh, fat signal. It's all getting stored in, in the fat and to begin with, in the uh, visceral tissue around the midsection. That's the first place it goes. So those are just some of the basic mechanisms and there's others. One of the other things that leaky gut does, because my gut is now uh, being leaky and sending in toxins, one of the things as it, that it does is it screws up that ghrelin response. And we saw this in our first published study where we took 
individuals, and these are people who are not overweight yet, but they had severe leaky gut, right? Um, they, and they were young, so their body was still managing the, the caloric burn and so on, so they're not putting on weight as easily. Um, but what, what we saw was that their ghrelin response, which is their hunger hormone response, did not work the same way as it did in people who were metabolically lean. So we brought them into the lab fasted which means their hunger hormone levels are really high, which is totally normal, right? And then we give them a 2,000 calorie meal. And after that meal, their hunger hormone levels barely drop, barely drop 10%, right? So their body is still producing hunger signals despite eating a 10,000 calorie meal, sorry, 2,000 calorie meal. Then we gave them a probiotic, uh, which, which we'll talk about what kind of probiotic and what it did, but we gave them a probiotic to stop the leakiness in, gut, in the gut. In 30 days when we did the same test, they came in, the ghrelin levels were high when they were fasted, we gave them the same exact meal, ghrelin levels within two hours dropped by 50%. So now their gut and their brain are talking again where the gut can tell the brain, hey, this is plenty of food, stop producing the hunger hormone, we don't need to eat anymore, right? So just that basic thing makes such a huge difference over time. Um, and that person that typically can eat whatever they want and lose weight, the key there is that number one, they're not pulling out as many calories from everything they eat. Number two, if you pay attention, they don't eat as much of everything as, as someone that struggles with, with weight. They know when to stop, right? And they stop and they have no more interest in food. So that metabolic communication in your body is 100% dependent on the microbiome. <laughs> Wow, mic drop. That was amazing. <laughs> I think um, if that's not enough for someone to have a bit of a woo-woo paradigm shift of weight loss, um, I don't know what would mm. shake someone up to think, wow, maybe you really, you really need to rethink this thing. There's more to it. So, you know, I'm sure there'll be plenty of people listening or watching right now that would be like, I am that person. They're, they're thinking of themselves at the meal, eating that, and then it's going straight to their midsection. Yeah. Meanwhile, friend, um, you know, over here is just piling it in and looks amazing. Um, so how to, like, before we get into the specific probiotics to help with that, I'm curious as well as to what leads someone to that point. Maybe they started off when they could eat anything. It was fine, but we know that food companies like to engineer foods a certain mm -hmm. way. We know that, um, certain things in our environment disrupt our gut bacteria. I just would love to hear the foundation of that before we then get into the probiotics. Yeah. So there's a number of very, very common things that we all get exposed to that actually lead to that dysbiosis. And that term is used to describe an imbalance in your in your microbiome uh, that leads to that dysbiosis that can then screw up your metabolic response to food. Right. Because really, at the end of the day, it, it, it is not as much about what you eat. It's about how your body responds to the food. And that's a really critical component to it. And so the most common drivers of that are courses of antibiotics that almost all of us have taken. But you could have gotten a course of antibiotics or maybe a multiple courses of antibiotics that then all of a sudden shot up the, the growth of certain types of bacteria like Clostridia, for example, um, or Klebsiella that promote weight gain. Um, and then you're stuck in that, in that new microbiome conformation and now you're struggling with it forever, right? And here's the tricky thing about the bacteria. The ones that make you gain weight, the ones that make you want to eat the stuff that you shouldn't be eating also have complete control of your brain, right? So that's a really important part. Uh, there was a years ago, there was this article written um, that was titled, My Bacteria Made Me Eat a Cupcake, right? <laughs> and, and it's so um, apropos because at the end of the day, there's something called the enteric nervous system. This is the really dense collection of neurons that covers your entire digestive tract. That nervous system is directly connected to your brain through the vagus nerve. Now, what tends to happen is microbes in your gut that want you to eat more sugar, for example, will create neurotransmitters, send it up the vagus nerve directly to your brain to make you crave sugar, right? They are controlling things. They are pulling the strings. There are microbes in there that can make you feel anxious. There are microbes in there that can make you feel more altruistic. Uh, that, that can make you want to go out and see people, then the microbes that can make you want to stay in and not see people. You know, it's amazing the controls they have because this is their ship, right? They're driving the ship in, in large part. So when we get exposed to certain things that all of a sudden change the balance in the gut, now we are leaning in one direction. And if we don't recorrect that e ecological balance, we will always struggle with a problem. So it could have been 
single course of antibiotics. Note uh, an interesting thing, and certainly in the US, in the cattle industry, they feed cattle antibiotics specifically to make them gain weight faster, right? That's one of the huge benefits of feeding them antibiotics. Um, there's a number of antibiotics where well-documented side effects are weight gain to it. Um, you know, and then there are things like Roundup. So if you're if you're getting exposed over time to things like glyphosate Roundup, right, the active ingredient Roundup, that has a very specific antibiotic effect in the gut where it kills off uh, some of the really critical good bacteria and allows the regrowth and overgrowth of, of uh, bacteria that create metabolic dysfunction. Um, there are things like just food choices, for example, if you spend a period of time eating a certain type of food, you actually select for certain types of bacteria within your gut. Stress is a big driver, so stress can make your gut more leaky and stress actually will create a response where there are uh, there are fungus, there are viruses, there are bacteria in your gut that are that know to respond to stress signals because they're opportunistic pathogens. The moment they read your stress hormones are high, they go, okay, the host is compromised. This is our time to shine. And they start proliferating. And one of the things they want when they proliferate is they want more sugar. So not only are they growing and then causing more inflammation, they're sending neurotransmitters to your brain to say, feed me more sugar. So many people, when they get stressed, what do they do? They eat, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when they eat, then you get a little bit of that dopamine response. And then that becomes your way of dealing with your stress. But all you're doing is feeding the cycle of those same bacteria over and over again, who will eventually screw up your metabolic response to food. So a number of those kind of common things uh, really set people off on the path of having this dysfunction that then becomes impossible to overcome unless you correct the ecological uh, dysfunction at the root. Ugh, this is so fascinating. I love this so much. Thanks, Kieran. All right, yeah. so we're all dying to know what do we do about it? <laughs> yeah, so so the critical thing is um, it, it's a it's a matter of doing a couple of things. One is we need to increase the diversity of bacteria in our gut, right? The, the studies are clear. People who struggle with weight tend to have lower diversity in the microbiome. People who have, uh, tend to be very lean uh, tend to have very high levels of diversity. So that's uh, factor number one. And I'll talk about how you do each of these things. Um, number two is acromancia. Acromancia mucinophila is a really critical strain that you need to have. At, and when you have it at high levels, you will be lean and you'll have no diabetes, no metabolic distress at all. Acromancia actually has been shown in, in dozens and dozens of studies to be inversely correlated, meaning when it's high, this uh, disease is low, um, against everything in the cardiometabolic syndrome spectrum. So things like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and so on, right? So very, very important strain. You also need high levels of short chain fatty acid production. So things like butyrate, propionate and acetate. So if we just focus on those three things, we'll start making changes. And now, and after I tell you how you make those changes, we can talk about a study we just completed as well that should be publishing. Um, so first, diversity. How do you increase diversity in your microbiome? Step one is to increase diversity in your diet, right? What you feed your microbiome will dictate what your ecosystem looks like. And so the more diversity you have in your diet, the more different types of foods you eat, the more diversity you'll have in your microbiome. I tell people like around here, just go to an ethnic grocery store, right? Go to the Middle Eastern market, the Asian market, because you'll find fruits and vegetables and roots and tubers there that you don't find at your regular grocery store. And just adding in one or two of those a week into some part of your diet will really expand the diversity of your microbiome. The second part of increasing diversity is getting outside. So, you know, just going out in nature. And in fact, you'll pick up lots of microbes in the natural environment that actually increase diversity. And when I say going outside, I mean not in like the engineered parks and all that, you know, your front yard, right? We mean like going on a hike, so going to the beach and, you know, getting involved in nature. That actually has a huge impact. Number three, fasting. If you can do some form of intermittent fasting, it's one of the most powerful things you can do to reset your metabolic response to food. One of the reasons for that is, two of the reasons for that is because it increases diversity and it's counterintuitive. Like, okay, not feeding the microbiome actually increases more bacteria. Yes, because your microbiome is divided into primary digesters and secondary digesters. So when you first put food in, only the primary digesters are functioning. They're digesting all the big molecules of the food, and then they're spitting out byproducts of that digestion, right? 
And then once they stop and finish, then the secondary digesters go to work and they start making their own byproducts from those, from those food byproducts. Now, if you're constantly bringing in food, the primary digesters are the only ones functioning. Secondary digesters don't get to expand. So having a period of not eating actually increases the overall diversity of your microbiome. It also increases the growth of acromancia which is that key bacteria. So it does it, it's a double whammy. Um, and it has massive function in terms of your cellular cleanup and all of that stuff. So uh, fasting is a very easy, cheap way. Obviously, it costs nothing to do it, right? Um, and then and then the- then Sorry to the, ruin your f flow. On the fasting, how, how long do you have to fast it for in order to see these sort of microbial responses? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the best way to do it is to start with about a 14 hour window and try to work your way up to a 16, 17 hour window. Now, most of that can be overnight, right? So the, there's lots of studies that show that if you go like the 8 p.m. to 12 noon, you're basically kind of skipping breakfast, you're not taking in anything caloric in the morning, then you're getting most of that benefit. Um, if you can push it a little bit and, and do 17 hours, that's totally fine. Now, if you can't, um, some people feel like they can't, some people feel like when they wake up, they're very hungry, just start pushing it a little bit. You know, if you wake up and the first thing you need to do is eat by eight o'clock, then for the next week, push it to 8.30 and then push it to nine and just kind of keep pushing it. There's still benefit, even if you're doing 12 hours, 13 hours and so on, but the magic window is around 16 hours, right? That's the magic window. Um, you can do this also five days a week and and skip skip doing it on the weekend if you don't want to do it every day. There's There's been a number of studies where they take um, animals and then they feed them the same exact amount of food and calories, but one set of animals they feed it to them within a sh eight hour window. The other and this other set of animals they let them eat it over a 12, 13 hour window. The 12, 13 hour window animals always gain weight, and and then the ones that eat it within an eight hour window never gain weight, right? So again, it's not as it's, it's not so much what you eat, it's when you eat it and how your body responds to it. So that's a really important part. And I'm glad you asked that. A lot of people will do things like 24, 48 hour fast, and they think they have to do a four day water fast. You don't have to do those things. Those can have other benefits if, it, if it's okay for your body. But for the most part, you can get a simple 14 to 16 hours a day. You're doing really awesome. Um, so that can okay. help. So Thank yeah, you. so those simple three things. Oh, here's another thing that can increase your diversity. Um, getting a dog. Um, the studies that show animal uh, households that have uh, outside pets like dogs actually have kids that have lower incidence rates of um, flus and allergies, asthma and so on. And that increases the diversity because the dogs are going out, bringing more microbes into your into your home. Right. So that can that can play a significant role as well. So those are the things you do for diversity. Then for acromancia, what do you do for acromancia? So fasting, as we said, already covers acromancia to a certain degree. Acromancia really loves polyphenols, right? That's one of the things that it feeds on. So red wine, dark chocolate, you know, this is your permission to do that and, and, and feed your acromancia going, uh, through it, right? But, but it likes the colored fruits and vegetables. Those are the things that it consumes at a higher rate than other microbes. So um, things like, you know, grapes and berries and all that it likes, but beets, you know, things with bright colors, fruits and vegetables. And you don't have to eat a whole lot of it and you don't have to make an entire meal out of it. You just got to get some of it into your system. Um, that really helps with acromancia. So then between the fasting, increasing the polyphenol intake, you've got your acromancia and your diversity covered. Then the next part is um, how do you increase short chain fatty acids, right? Because you need that butyrate, you need the propionate and so on. One of the key ways is doing resistant starches. So, you know, you doing a, um, a sweet potato, for example, or, or different types of roots and tubers, getting in some things like cassava into your diet, um, you know, yucca and all these different kind of roots and tubers, or taking a supplement that has things like oligosaccharides, which are important prebiotics. All of those things are the things that go in, make its way to the colon, and then get converted to short chain fatty acids during your, your uh, digestive process. And then the last and final thing that's going to be really, really critical is stopping the leaky gut. Because if your gut continues to be leaky, you will continue to gain weight. Leaky gut is, is the originator of weight gain. There was a, two studies published by the American Diabetic Association that, that showed, because the previous studies to that showed that obese and diabetic individuals had severe leaky gut, right? And then the question came up, 
did they have severe leaky gut because they're obese and diabetic? Or did they become obese and diabetic because they had severe leaky gut to begin with? And, and then the, the latter turns out to be true. They became obese and diabetic because they had leaky gut to begin with. So that leaky gut is a major driver of metabolic dysfunction. In fact, when, that, when those toxins from your gut leak into your circulatory system and they go and they migrate with the fatty tissue in your, in your abdomen, it actually physically swells the fat cells almost to two and a half times its size, right? So it, it has that kind of impact. So diversity, acromancia, short chain fatty acids, stop leaky gut, those four things, you will do something I call metabolic reprogramming. It completely changes how your body responds to food. You can become that person that's so annoying that can eat anything they want, never gain weight. <laughs> very good wonderful I'm, I'm i'm assuming there'll be so many people here listening and just being like so frustrated and i guess like this cycle gets so worse when you're just like well i just don't have enough willpower um yeah. you know and they and they spike they hit new years they're part of the many millions of people that want to start a new diet and fix things but they're not fixing you know some of these these core metabolic things that you're talking about that are inside our guts that are hijacking our brains um which i think is such a fascinating process so what are the, uh, is it possible, say someone's had like, um, you know, they've had antibiotics and, and they feel like their gut is completely decimated. Is it possible to fully rebuild your microbiome again without having a fecal transplant? Yeah, so that's a really good and important question. And, and it absolutely is, right? So one of the fascinating, fascinating things about microbes is um, they never disappear. You never completely lose certain categories of microbes. It's just that their, uh, their proportions and their population become so low that they're no longer functional in your system, right? So you get this shift. Um, it's no different than your garden. If you're not tending to it well, you're going to get weeds that are taken over, but the roots of some of those plants that you wanted there are still there. It's just a matter of jumping into the garden and changing the ecosystem so your weeds can come out and you can, you can let your plants flourish, flourish. So the whole idea is about changing the ecosystem so that the good microbes that are gonna support a healthy metabolic response will actually flourish. So you can absolutely do it. And a, a lot of people say like, oh, I had so many courses of antibiotics, I had went through this surgery, I did all this. The microbes are still there, right? You can have it to a point where you have one of them, just one cell, just hanging on every, <laughs> every uh, you know, 12 hours, it's multiplying itself and just hanging on for the rest of your life. Um, and you just give it the right conditions and it'll come back. And I think one of the th key things that you said, Matt, that was really important was that, you know, what makes it so hard for people to lose weight is that they try things that are so outside of their normal scope of behavior, right? So you go on a, on a really intense diet. So you're completely changing your eating habits and all of the things that ties you to food emotionally and all that. You're trying to really divorce yourself from how you normally behave. And then on top of that, you're trying to go to the gym and slave away for 45 minutes, an hour, two hours a day, because that's the formula that people have been teaching you. But that is so non-sustainable. You cannot sustain that kind of lifestyle because it's completely outside of your norm. And then on top of that, if you're not seeing the results from it, it just keeps reinforcing that it that you're you've got no capability of controlling the way your body looks, right? It just reinforces that, and makes it harder and harder. What does that do? It makes you more stressed. It makes your gut more leaky. It makes it easier to get fat, right? So ultimately, um, you know, we wanted to do a study that said, okay, can we do uh, metabolic reprogramming without changing anything about somebody's behavior or lifestyle, right? Can we make them lose weight? just by changing their microbiome. Let them do everything they do that, that keeps them overweight. But let's just change their microbiome and see if it, can, if it can happen. We completed this study last year at the University of Texas, and hopefully it'll be published sometime in the next year or so. But here's what we found. We took overweight individuals um, over a 90-day period, and we did a placebo-controlled, um, and we gave them a probiotic and a prebiotic, right? So just, just a combination of two. The total number of capsules per day, I think, with three, three or four. Um, and they took two in the morning, two in the evening. Um, so it was four capsules a day. We said, do not do any sort of any new exercise plan, anything that, uh, you know, don't change your diet. They're still eating fast food every day. They're still sitting on the couch. Um, you know, they're not changing any of their behavior in that 90 day period. 
with the people that got the probiotic and prebiotic compared to the people that got uh, the placebo, the people that got the probiotic and prebiotic lost upwards of 35% of their visceral midsection fat, right? They lost so much of the most important kind of fat that drives inflammation and metabolic disease by doing nothing. Um, and on top of that, their blood sugar control levels came came down quite dramatically. The the inflammatory uh, cytokines in their system went down dramatically. The the markers that indicated their body had more stable blood sugar throughout the day that improved dramatically. And then using the dual X-ray scan, we were able to see that not only did they lose fat, they actually gained a little bit of lean mass, a little bit of muscle, without working out. Right. So it's 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 just absolutely fascinating. Now, I wouldn't prescribe anyone that said do all this, you know, bad lifestyle and you'll still lose weight. That's not the idea. The idea is that um, can we actually make a difference in their metabolic response to food without changing behavior and just focusing on the microbiome? And sure enough, we can. Right. So that's metabolic reprogramming. We're changing how your body responds to food. If you add diet and exercise on top of that, even at some level, the the response is going to be phenomenal. Just on the topic of exercise, I've seen some studies where even just starting to change your exercise routine immediately shifts the microbiome. Can you explain how that happens? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we study leaky gut a lot, right? That's kind of been our big focus uh, because leaky gut is at the root cause of so many different uh, chronic conditions. Um, there, the researchers that we work with at University of Texas that study leaky gut did a couple of studies on low-grade exercise prior to eating and in, in, in people that had leaky gut. What they found was just doing 20 minutes of some low-intensity movement um, before a meal actually dramatically reduced the, uh, the amount of toxicity that the meal created in people who have leaky gut. So people who have leaky gut, um, and your audience may not know this, but when you have leaky gut and you eat a meal, within five hours of that meal, you get a five-fold increase in inflammatory uh, toxins in your system. And it takes your body a whole two days to come down from that inflammation. Right. And so if you're eating again in five, six hours, it's going to spike up again and, and start to come down. But then you eat again, it spikes up again, starts to come down. So you're in this constant state of inflammatory response. And that's part of what drives all these chronic illnesses. What they found was that when you do a little bit of exercise and movement right before the meal, it actually really blunts that inflammatory response and reduces the leakiness of the gut. Now, why is that? Well, um, there are a number of bacteria in your gut that actually respond to energy needs in your body. There's something called the microbiome mitochondrial access, right? So mitochondria are those little powerhouses in the cells, right, in your body, in all of your, cell, in all of your cells in your body. The only cells that don't have mitochondria are red blood cells because they're focused on one thing, carrying oxygen. Every other cell in your body has um, you know, upwards of hundreds of mitochondria to produce energy for you as you need it. Now, as it turns out, when your mitochondria, which actually are ancient bacteria, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second if we have time, uh, but your mitochondria are actually made up of ancient bacteria. When your mitochondria has a demand for energy, it actually sends signals to your microbiome and your microbiome produces compounds that have helped feed your mitochondria. Right. And then because of those signals, it helps propagate certain bacteria that help with metabolic response. So even a little bit of movement, even a little bit of resistance exercise, if you do 10 minutes of some sort of resistance exercise, if you do eight minutes of just some movement, that's enough to start changing the microbiome. Right. So the microbiome responds to all kinds of stuff around you, even things you cannot see or perceive. Um, it, it responds to the people that you spend your time with. It responds to the pets you keep around you. It even responds if your spouse, Matt, if you had an infection, right, and you were given a course of antibiotics. And this is a study done by Johns Hopkins University and published about two years ago. If you are given a course of antibiotics, it's no surprise that taking that course of antibiotics is going to create dysbiosis in your microbiome, right? Everybody knows that. The, from the first dose of, my, of the antibiotic, your microbiome is going to get decimated to a certain degree. As it grows back, it's going to grow back a little bit more screwy than it was before. And so multiple courses of the, or multiple doses of the antibiotics, by the end of that course, your microbiome is going to be off. And what they found is that for about six months after you, you started taking the antibiotic, the microbiome is still off. But here's the crazy thing. 
they also followed both platonic and intimate partners of the person that was taking the, uh, the antibiotic, and they found that their microbiome got screwed up in the same way too, just by being around each other all the time, right? So Sarah, you would have the same dysbiosis because Matt's taking a course of antibiotics. How dare you? You're the reason I'm putting on weight. <laughs> You're ruining marriages everywhere, Kieran, with this, with this message. It's your spouse that made you eat that cup <laughs> and antibiotics, I tell you. Uh, so kick him to the curb and you'll be sick. <laughs> oh, wow. That's but, but, you know, wild. Thing. It's a, it's a, we have a microbiome cloud around us, right? Who we choose to surround ourselves with will influence what our microbiome looks like. And because it can change what our microbiome looks like, it's going to affect how we respond to things, how we respond to emotional cues, food, and so on. So um, we have to pay so much attention to this, right? We have to pay attention not only to what we put in our system, but what's around us all the time. All of that has an impact. Mm. Wow. <laughs> wow. Let's just process that for a minute. <laughs> wow. Awesome. I'm glad you asked that question. That was awesome. Thank you, Kieran. My yeah. next question has to do with probiotics. How, meaning probiotics that we take in a pill, how do they actually impact our innate microbiome? Do they actually make it down there? Do they actually seed in there? How do they modulate what's going on? Yeah, so that's a question that I had myself about 10 years ago when I when I decided to take my microbiology knowledge and capabilities and focus it on probiotics, right? Because I became fascinated with this idea of how do we modulate the microbiome? Can we impact it in some way? Um, when I went out into the market, you see a whole bunch of probiotics, many of them 15 strains, 30 strains, 100 billion, 200 billion CFU, all kinds of various formulations. Um, my first question is, can these bacteria actually make it into the intestine? Because when you look at our upper GI, it's actually designed to kill bacteria. That's a big part of its focus, right? So um, to begin with, in your saliva, you've got a whole bunch of alpha amylase, which can break up certain bacteria. You've got secretory IgA. So you've got all these antibodies that come in and neutralize microbes. Then as it makes its way down your, your uh, throat and it goes in or your uh, esophagus and then it goes into your stomach, you've got stomach acid. And stomach acid is called a gastric barrier because it's designed not only to start the digestion process, but to kill stuff, right? So it's designed to kill bacteria. Then when you make it past the stomach, you go into the small intestine, there's pancreatic enzymes that also kill bacteria, and then this bile. And bile is one of the most potent um, antimicrobials there is naturally. And then bile causes the intestinal lining in the small intestine to secrete more natural antimicrobials, right? So there's all of these gauntlets in place <laughs> for microbes to get through, to get to where they're supposed to uh, work, which is in the large intestine, right? So they're going through this like hellish environment for a bacteria for about 20 something feet before they get to the promised land. And as it turns out, the vast majority of microbes used in probiotics do not make it there. Right. Most of them do not survive the, the gastric system to begin with. And we did this test when I first started into this business. I took 40 of the top selling probiotics in the States um, and we put it through simulated gastric solution. There's a pharmacopoeia standard for how you do that, uh, which simulates the probiotic going through the mouth and through the stomach. And what I found is 98 percent of it all got decimated in the stomach. Right. So all of those bacteria got wiped out. So that was kind of discouraging. I was like, okay, so are these doing anything? That was a question. Now, then I started researching and finding some of these bifido and lactose strains did actually do some stuff in the system because they've got clinical trials that show rhamnosus GG actually has this impact on your immune35624 or bifidobacterium infantis 35624 actually has an impact on your, your um, immune response. Then the question became, if they're not surviving, then how do they have an impact? And as it turns out, some of these highly specialized strains actually have nanoparticles and other components within them that when they die, they release into your system and it can have a metabolic response. But it's a temporary metabolic response that goes away the moment the, the microbial components are gone, right? And the moment it goes through your system and you poop it out. So they're they're not making any real lasting change in the microbiome. In some cases, they can give you certain relief. So we really honed in on this idea of, are there microbes that can actually survive this gauntlet and go in and start changing your microbiome? 
What we came to find out is there's lots of studies on showing that people who live and interact with the natural environment, so people who live in rural areas, for example, or in sub-Sahara Africa and Bangladesh and certain villages, they tend to have a very different microbiome than people that live in the city, right? So clearly there's some connection there between being closer to nature and being exposed to things like dirt and then being in a concrete jungle in the city. And so we started honing in and said, okay, there are certain microbes that you get exposed to in abundance in this natural environment that you wouldn't get exposed to in, in any reasonable amount in the urban environment that may be having an impact on your microbiome. And we drill down into these spores, these bacterial spores. And as it turns out, the bacterial spores have been used in the pharmaceutical industry since 1952. Uh, because they're so potent and they have this natural capability of surviving through this gauntlet and they can get through into the small intestine alive. And then what they do when they get into the gut is absolutely fascinating. And that's where we really went do dove in head first. I don't know if you guys want to hear about that part at all, because not for sure. <laughs> yeah. So let me give you a little story of a moment um, uh, of, of how the first discovery of the action of these spores actually occurred. Um, so during World War II, when the German army was in North Africa, um, a lot of the soldiers in North Africa were dying from dysentery. Right. So it wasn't the battle. They weren't really having much war there, but they were getting sick from dysentery and dying. What they realized was that the locals, when they would get sick, they would actually seek out and grab dried camel dung and they would eat camel dung. And that would actually make their guts fine. Right. It was like a cure for them. And so the Germans realized, well, what the hell's in this camel dung? They took a bunch back. And one of the pharma companies in Germany actually investigated it and found that in the camel dung, they had high contents of spores. And these spores, these bacterial spores, um, and, and the reason you call them spores is because when they're outside of the body, when they're in the outside environment, they cover themselves with this protein calcified armor. And they're kind of in the suspended state of animation. They're not rep replicating. They're not doing all the things bacteria are doing. They're sitting there in in a uh, in a state of um, of just a suspension, right? And they're waiting to get back in the gut. Now, what they found when they started growing these spores with like pathogenic bacteria and all that, they found that the spores had the capability of just decimating the pathogenic bacteria. So then they realized when they did clinical trials that if you had an illness, if you had a bacterial overgrowth that was causing an illness, you took a spore, the spore would go into the gut, it would use something called quorum sensing, which is microbes re reading each other's signatures, chemical signatures, it would sit and surround the uh, pathogenic bacteria and it would kill that pathogenic bacteria. And so that was fascinating. So they launched it in Europe in 1952 as a prescription treatment for dysentery and other gut infections, right? So we realized and we learned that and our hypothesis was, okay, the spores are smart enough to go into the system, find dysfunctional bacteria, because the question is, how do they know that bacteria shouldn't be there, right? Uh, how is it they have that intelligence to go, those guys are not, they're not being well, they're not... Uh, doing a good job of that, playing nice. So they figure that out. They go sit around those bacteria. They bring them down. Our thinking was, can they also improve the growth of the good bacteria that should be there? Because they have this innate intelligence. And that's the area that we started focusing on is, yes, they can bring down bad bacteria. There's a bunch of evidence of that. Can they actually increase your good bacteria, especially your acromancias, your uh, bifidobacteria, all of the other keystone strains that are really important for your gut health. Sure enough, we found right off the bat as we started studying this, that when you put spores into your system, they go bring down the bad bacteria, but they dramatically increase the growth of good bacteria, right? So they play this orchestrative role in your gut. They get in there, they're kind of the police of the gut, they somehow know what our gut microbiome is supposed to look like, and they will go in there and fix it for us. And that is just mind boggling for a microbiome nerd like myself. Oh, man. Awesome. Thank you for answering that question because we, we mm. get that a lot. And, and of course, we don't, we uh, have not been able to answer as eloquently <laughs> as that. Thank you. I'm a bit grossed out yeah. by the camel dung thing, to be honest, but, <laughs> but great discoveries. Awesome. So. We may you're talking yes. if it wasn't for eating camel dung. So. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? right. We must pay respect to yep. the dung. <laughs> um, so for those out there that uh, want to invest in a good probiotic, a good spore-based probiotic, is there any um, 
kind of uh, any factors they should be aware of? Yeah. So I think one of the most important things, and this should be uh, a factor that they should be aware of for any probiotic, right, including a spore, is are there any studies on the actual formulation, right? Because ultimately what you're dealing with is microbes. They are living entities that are highly complex. They've got lots of DNA in them. They've got lots of protein, all kinds of things in them. What you don't know unless you study them is what did they do to the native bacteria in your gut, right? There's a study that came out, two studies now that came out of the of a massive Israeli academy that shows that a lot of the t conventional probiotic formulas, if you take it after you take a course of antibiotics, it actually slows down the regrowth of your own native bacteria because they tend to compete with their own native bacteria. So it keeps you dysbiotic longer, right? And that's counterintuitive in the industry in general. You wouldn't know that until you studied it. So one of the things that we try to impart on the industry at large is that if you're gonna put together a probiotic bacteria, because the microbiome is so important to health and wellness, you've got to study it. You've got to know what it does in the gut. So we currently have, with the spore uh, probiotic we work with, with the megaspore, we currently have, I think, seven published studies. And we've got um, four more that are done that are in peer review right now to be published. And then I think we have five or six more going on right now. So, you know, awesome. we study the heck out of it because we really want to understand two things. One is... Um, making sure that it's doing favorable things in the system. And number two, what is it doing and how can we take advantage of some of those functions in different conditions, right? So we've got studies on acne going on. We have one publish, uh, publishing in acne showing a massive reduction in acne lesion counts in, in uh, 30 days of taking the probiotic. We've got studies in things like triglycerides, the, the obesity one I just explained to you. All of these factors are uh, are being impacted in a positive way. Why? Because we are fixing the root cause, which is that dysbiosis and that leaky gut. So my recommendation to anyone, if you're looking at a probiotic, make sure that the probiotic you're you're looking at has published studies on the final formula. And that's going to be critical. If not, you have no idea what it's going to do in your system. Great advice. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I'm sure we're just... Scratch the surface. I of, know, we, could go, we could go on for hours. Um, but if people want to learn more about you and um, continue to on this journey and your work, what's the best place of connecting with you? Yeah. So um, if you want to connect directly with me, I try to be as active as I can on social media, which I'm terrible at. But um, I try to be act as active as I can on Instagram. I think my handle is K Kiran, K K I. R A N underscore zero zero, which is a horrific <laughs> handle. Uh, we'll put it in no the show notes ever. below for everyone confused like myself. <laughs> Thank you. And then on Facebook, uh, I'm on there as well. You just put my name, uh, Karen Krishnan, and you'll you'll hopefully find me. Um, if you want to hear a lot of talks and all that, that I've done, you can go put my name in YouTube. Lots of um, videos will come up. And then uh, come to our website, microbiomelabs.com. We've got lots of resources on there for learning. Um, I do a lot of lecturing, of course. Outside of COVID time, I was doing about 55, 60 lectures at conferences worldwide a year. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a lot of different places all the time. Uh, and we put the whole schedule on there. So if, you're, if I'm ever in your area and you want to come watch a lecture, come do that. Um, but, um, but yeah, right now in COVID time, it's all online. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Awesome. So definitely give him a follow and there's so much more to learn and we'd love to have you back to um, continue exploring because I think yes, this please. information is life changing. Like there's so many people that are stuck, particularly, you know, we've spoken mostly about weight loss, but are stuck in these metabolic loops that have been more or less, they're a victim of the environment than they realize. And to just discover these basic things can be life changing for people mm -hmm. and re massively reduce their chances of, you know, lifestyle diseases um, so thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I think it's so important. And um, yeah, we can't wait to get this message out to there. And if anyone that's listening right now, well, let us know in the comments as to what you think. What are some of those aha moments, I think, because I just think this is mind blowing stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. You know, all of the work uh, that we do on the research side and all that, it would mean nothing if we can't get it out to people. So I'm always extremely grateful for these kind of opportunities to be able to get this messaging out to people. So thank you for creating these platforms and, and getting us nerds to be able to talk to real humans uh. out there, you know? Um, and and one, one last thing I'd love to say to people is uh, one of the most exciting things about 
this era of science that we're in where we're learning about the microbiome and how it impacts everything uh, within your health and wellness and your outcomes is that there's lots and lots of hope, right? Like lots of things that we thought were things that we could not really cure, like take um, a, a condition like Alzheimer's. It's an extremely scary thing. Parkinson's, extremely scary thing. Certain types of cancers, all very scary and, and incurable in many ways. Within the next few years, there are gonna be probiotic microbiome solutions to all of those, because all of those scary chronic illnesses have a massive root, uh, uh, massively rooted in microbiome dysfunctions. You know, so we are in a really exciting time where we're finally learning about how we work and how we function as a species. And so there's lots of hope. So if you're struggling with anxiety, depression, weight management, skin issues, acne, all of those things can be helped by, by fixing your microbiome. So you have a lot more control than you think. And there's a lot of hope out there that you can really overcome the things that you're struggling with. So uh, feel good about it, you know, and do your research and get educated. There are lots of things you can do. Oh, wonderful. What a great message to end on. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kieran. It's been our privilege having you today. Same here. Thank you. Well, I hope your mind's been blown as much as our mind's been blown. That was such a great interview. And I just I just feel that this information is really needs to get out there. Like, I'm sure you'll be listening to this and thinking about that one person that really needs to hear this, that has maybe struggled with their weight their whole life or has some form of metabolic issue. And I would love for you guys just to grab the link or hit that share button below and send, get this message out. I think this can change the world, this sort of message. This, and you're at the frontier of this sort of information. And I think that's amazing. So hit that like button, hit that share button. And um, that really helps get the video out there more and hit subscribe because that'll really help as well. And of course, let us know in the comments. I know I've already asked you, but let us know in the comments, what did you think? What were some of your aha moments? We'd love to hear from you. And uh, yeah, we'll see you again next week. Bye for now.